Welcome to the Made for Agriculture podcast with Adam, Cameron, and Emily. Today's hosts are Adam Jones and Cameron Horan. All right, folks, welcome to another episode of the Made for Agriculture podcast. My name is Adam Jones. And I'm and, Cameron And we've got everybody on the horn again this morning. Uh, appreciate you being here, Cameron. Uh, especially in good spirits. Monday morning, uh, we're kind of making up for uh, kind of the long holiday weekend there. So uh, I've got Kevin, Shane, and Scott, and Jesse on the horn with us this morning. We're going to try to run around the countryside and uh, and see what's going on. So good morning, gentlemen. And we will start with uh, we'll start with Kevin Moore. What's going on in uh, up in the North Country? Yeah, so uh, corns, a lot of corn tasseling, pollinating, um, planes flying, spraying that fungicide on, trying to get that on on timely um you know we've had a lot of gray leaf spot um early on been reporting tar spot in several of the north counties um uh, but you know with having having tar spot around for a couple of years think um guys are less likely to play play around with fungicides we're just putting it on because the um you know the yield loss is known um to be pretty pretty high with tar spot so it seems like as soon as uh those fields are fully tasseled. We're getting that fungicide on, and and it does it it, it does really seem to be slowing that disease down. Where where we've been seeing some lesions, but um, they don't really seem to be spreading as drastically as what we've seen the you know seen the past couple of years. So so things are working the way they're supposed to. It appears as of now, uh, soybeans. We do have some earlier planted beans um, into that R three stage, and we're starting to see some of those fungicide and insecticide applications in soybeans um we do have been seeing some frog eye leaf spot along with some less serious diseases the septoria downy mildew um you know, the the more more commonly seen diseases uh japanese beetles are are out uh doing a little defoliation bean leaf beetles um starting to see some the next round of stink bugs so um that fungicide um does go a long way in making that soybean plant healthy and which also makes it attractive to insects so adding that insecticide is going to keep those bug numbers down and let that fungicide do do what it's supposed to do so that's um you know uh, corn corn will be winding down and on fungicide beans are starting and i would say we're a little ways before on beans before we kind of see those peak amount of applications but it'll be coming soon so a lot of things happen in this month yeah absolutely good stuff kevin um yeah i feel like we're, we're spread out a little bit this year we had a couple couple big runs as far as planting and so that that kind of spreads our fungicide out just a little bit um and, uh, over a longer period of time too court to stage that stuff correctly shannon uh what's going on down there for you yeah, so pretty similar to uh, to what Kevin just said. We've got corn that's, you know, V7, V8, so that late planted corn, but all that first planted corn is either R2, R3 right now. Um, fungicide applications are wrapping up on it. Um, soybeans, we range, we have we have a lot of double crop beans, so a lot of beans are either just emerging or just, or just planted. Um, but our first planted beans are also R3, and uh, we're starting to starting to hit that with fungicide insecticide to mirror off what Kevin was talking about. Uh, one thing that I think Jesse's going to talk about maybe a little bit more, but uh, weed control on those first crop beans. Um, we had a lot of escapes where we were, you know, either a pre didn't go on because it was too dang wet when the first plant beans got planted or we just broke through. Uh, we've been struggling on our post herbicide applications, getting those weeds um, controlled. Uh, when we start getting, you know, the reproductive stages, we got to start washing what we're using because we do get off label, even on our common herbicides like Roundup and Liberty. So it's, it's been a little bit of a challenge there. Um, double crop beans stands all up great. We've had, we've had the moisture here the last couple of weeks that I don't know that there's gonna be too many replants on them. And I, I think we're all, but all but done with planting now. So, um, it's setting back and, and watching the crops grow for the rest of the summer. Yeah, sounds good, Shannon. Or Shannon, I appreciate the appreciate the update. And uh, yeah, I think uh, pretty common theme there of of having issues with uh, post wheat control in, in soybeans this year. And um, I, I think in a lot of cases for us anyway, uh, you know, we just had enough rains 
Um, there's been enough time lapse since a lot of those pre's went on. You know, I, I just don't know that we could expect much more than what we've gotten out of them. Um, but it's one of those years where we still need them out there. So, um, Scott, I'll let you kind of take over and go from there and give us an update on your area. Yeah, kind of like the other guy said, uh, a lot of planes flying the last couple of weeks. Most of our corn, good good amount of our corn, rather, you know, falling between R1 and R3 right now. Um, soybeans, uh, a lot of R2, R3. Um, I guess the difference this week on beans, we've, we've had a lot of beans that, that have been at R3 for, you know, 10 days or better, um, kind of kept our powder dry as far as fungicide goes on those, but we're going to go ahead and start turning those loose this week. Um, most, most of those, as Kevin said, will have, have an insecticide, um, here on the earlier side, you know, there could be a cause call for, uh, insecticide later in the season, you know, depending on what happens with, uh, sting bugs, pod worms, that kind of thing. But, uh, feel like those beans that have already been at R3, it's, it's time to, to, to turn loose of them. Going forward, the beans that, uh, you know, hit R3 in the next, next 10 days, um, you know, two weeks, three weeks, depending on the, on the, the maturity, we will turn those loose just about as soon as they get to R3. Um, but, uh, like I say, for those that have already been there, we, we held off a little bit, but it'll be different as we get, as we, uh, move further into, to July and beyond. Um, uh, kind of like, uh, Shane was talking about, uh, dealing with a lot of post weed control. Um, you know, we have had good luck out of the pre's this year. Um, you know, some of the best control I've probably seen is, is when somebody has a particular trait that's not the common trait in, in that area. And they really relied heavily on pre so they don't get in a situation, you know, posting and, and having to worry about, you know, getting on a neighbor or something like that. And those aggressive overlapping pre's have, uh, have, have really looked good. Um, really try to stress to everybody what overlapping means. That doesn't mean sequential pre's, you know, where some weeds break in between. It's truly laying another pre on before the second or before anything breaks through. Um, the difficult thing we're obviously here with that is, is we obviously really depend on the weather. We, you know, we had guys do that last year. We didn't get the weather. Um, this year we did. And, um, you know, benefited from that. But uh, I think Jesse's going to talk a little more about some other things we're seeing and, and even looking towards the future with. Um, say the only other thing, uh, you know, we're we're uh, river watching in the central part of the state uh, and, and beyond, I guess. But, uh, of course, Missouri runs through, through my area. And, um, you know, we had some water out on the west side. Uh, at least Friday I was I was getting some calls, had some really good good-looking corn that, had anywhere from, you know, a foot of water over it to, uh, you know, almost up to the year. Um, looking at some of the, some of the, um, levels this morning, um, it's looking like we crested over the weekend on the Missouri, um, several more days to go. looks like on the Mississippi and, and, you know, while I was looking at that, it was, it was raining pretty hard. Um, I don't know that it was necessarily doing anything that was going to affect the Missouri, but looking at the forecasts up North, I think that's, that's going to be driving a lot of it now. Um, but beyond that, I think, uh, I think that's it. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks, Scott. Um, I got a question for you while you were unmuted and, and on the horn too. Um, you know, I, don't, I think we could, we could kind of talk about the airplane versus drone versus helicopter thing on corn and belabor that to death. And I don't know that, um, uh, we're going to come to a, a solution that really agronomically makes a difference, um, on soybeans though. Um, you got any thoughts on, on aerial versus ground application on that soybean fungicide pass? If we can get over the acres, I, I like a ground rig still. Um, in fact, I mean, I've, I've talked to guys that own drones that still run ground rigs through their beans, um, just because of, you know, what they believe they've seen. Um, you know, I, I don't want to make a. I haven't seen any kind of trials where we've done one versus another. So, I mean, what I'm, you know, me talking to folks that own drones or, or just my personal thoughts, um, it's, it's pretty anecdotal. Um, you know, with, with a plane, you start, uh, 
with a plane, you start getting some different dynamics, you know, that, that I don't believe you're going to see with a drone. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I've, uh, one of my earliest experiences when, when I was up North, we used, you know, we had a, had a local guy that we were able to call pretty quick and even had an airstrip there at the store I worked at Cahoka. And, uh, you know, we could, we could call him up for 50 acres, you know, you know, just, it wasn't a big ordeal like it is to, to bring a plane in now and, you know, have several days worth of work to, to get them in. Jesse probably is able to do some of that too, just with the, with the planes, if you can get them. But, uh, you know, I remember calling him over to spray, you know, chest high beans with, uh, with a product that, uh, absolutely needed coverage. I think we were using a PPO post and didn't want to, didn't want to run through them. And, uh, you know, I watched the, the pilot and, and the chemical rip at the time. This is going all the way back to American cyanamid days. I mean, I almost thought they were going to come to blows arguing about whether or not they would be able to, to do any good. Um, you know, the, the pilot just swore up and down he would, you know, that kind of, you know, even with a couple gallon or whatever it was. And I mean, you know, we killed everything out there. Um, but you know, when that plane comes in, I mean, just, you know, I don't know what they're doing when they, when they fly over the top of it, but I mean, you know, just the speed and, and everything, uh, in this case, I remember he came back with, uh, beans wrapped around his wheels. Cause I kind of, I commented to him, I said, you know, we called you, so we wouldn't have tracks in the field. <laughs> so he was, he was obviously laying it down in, in there, but you know, got several things like that where you just, you know, I don't know that we would have had that same activity with, with a the drone. They definitely do create some, some turbulence underneath them. And, and you see the, you know, the weed there, the leaves whipping all over the place, but I don't know that it's the, the same situation. So, you know, it's something I've, I've talked with one of our, the tech guys from one of the companies we do a lot of business with fungicide wise about looking at some different things like that. I know, uh, Dr. Bradley's looking at some things at the university. Mm -hmm. Um, but I mean, I think, it, I feel like it really needs to be however you would set up some kind of a, I don't know how you do a, a side by side with that kind of deal, but anything else is, is anecdotal. I mean, I guess, but too late for a short answer, but the short answer to your question is, uh, guys that even have drones in some cases I know will, will run the, run a ground rig over their beans. I um, just, I mean, one a gallon versus a couple gallon. I'm, you know, cheapest thing you're throwing in the tank's water. So if you've got the access to it, it's. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, and I, I agree. I, it's kind of what I expected you to say, Scott. I think there is a difference on, um, I feel like, especially on the beans where you're trying to push it all the way through that canopy and, um, achieve that coverage goal and, you know, tracks every hundred, 120 foot anymore. Don't, don't really bother me. Um. Yeah, I mean, that's just it. I mean, we're not running tracks every 60 foot. Yeah, that's right. We, that's different. Um, yeah. yeah. I think the other thing, though, Scott, is is part of the reason why guys just feel more comfortable with the ground rig still is because most of the times we're not just pushing a fungicide through, right? So we have so many other tank mix components now. Having the extra volume of water just makes guys feel more comfortable from just a tank mix compatibility, right? Um, you know, if you're running three gallons to an airplane and you're running a foliar product that's a quart per acre and you're fun aside it you know a pint and you start adding all this stuff together you don't have less water right and so i think part of that is too is just comfort comfort from that as well so well we run a lot of foliar products that are a gallon per acre correct you know i mean you're not you're not left with a lot of water so right Yep, that's right. right. Good stuff. Said that too. I mean, I I don't know that we're running into issues with that. I mean, we you know we're running a lot of those and and getting along fine. I mean, um, you know, in addition to that, we're you know a lot of time it's going to have power shot in it, and and even with that, um, you know, we're not. I'm not hearing of of issues with uh, you know having any compatibility in that plane. Right. Yep. Okay. Moving on. Jesse, I'm going to throw it down to you and uh, let you give us a little update. Oh, so you let me clean up, huh? Yep, yep. You get you, you get to cover everything these guys missed. Yeah, and what they told me I had to cover. <laughs> <laughs> so we kind of, with the southern half, everything that got planted early, I mean, really, it's just kind of the dog days of summer for them. Fungicide's over with. Uh, we have been getting scattered rain, so irrigation hasn't been near as bad as what it normally is for the 4th of July run. Uh, it's kind of been laxed, but it's just everybody's kind of just watching things grow 
at that point. We get into the northern half. Of, majority of the fungicides are over with. We got some outlying corn for guys still wanting to plant some late. That's V7, V8. Uh, the big thing we're watching on that, and they kind of different people mentioned it, but we got a hurricane coming up from the south and it's supposed to be here tonight or tomorrow and Wednesday. So we've been waiting for southern rust to show up. So that's going to be kind of prime weather to get it up here. So that's a big watch. And anybody who's got lake corn, even like up in Scott's area, like if you ain't putting fungicide out, I would highly, highly recommend it. Because once southern rust gets here, there ain't no turning back on that part. Uh, still seeing a little frog guy in the beans. Uh, nothing major yet, but again, we, we keep this moisture up. I know I've said it for what I feel like a month now. It's just a matter of time for some of these diseases to start showing up and better off to be preventative on the front side and protect your yield than trying to be reactive on the back side. Uh, Cause we got beans that are all the way up to R5 in places. I mean, they kind of hung them guys. Scott was talking about it. Just some of these beans just kind of hanging out at R2, R3 there for a while. But after the summer solstice, ours just took off, found another gear and they're just flying. Uh, we were kind of talking about it for a minute before we started recording. Uh, and I'll probably let Kevin talk about it for a second, but we were trying to decide how soon some of these beans are going to finish these because we got anything from four four to four eights that are late R4 or R5. And he was asking me about August time frame. And Kevin, you want to kind of say again what we were talking about before we started recording? Yeah. So something we, that, that I'd kind of noticed the past couple of years, you know, we have this trend of planting beans early and what we're seeing with early planted beans is more yield potential because we have more time to put more pods on longer growing season. So with that, um, you know, to fill all those extra pods, we need more water. So the, I believe just kind of from what I've seen that the having those late rains, whether depending on your geography, whether it be late August, like uh, as far as in the North goes late August, early September rains on these early planted beans are really, really critical to maximize that the yield potential out of all those pods that we have. Um, you know, if we're just the more, you know, the more, if, if we have, if we're doing something to give us more yield potential, we need, um, need more going into to it to fulfill that potential and a big thing's water. So that just, just kind of some observations I'd, I'd made over the past couple of years where, where we've had um, early planted beans and late rains versus early planted beans without late rains. And there's, um, there's some pretty, there's been some pretty big yield differences there. Well, and I, as everybody was talking, I was thinking about it. With us having irrigation down here, I really don't notice that early senescent we get in that time frame. But anytime you got something finishing up in the heat of the summer, whether it's like for me, end of July, first of August, or you in August and September, like anything don't get rain ain't going to do good. So maybe I don't notice as much because we do water all the way out through once they start turning. So, but because Jones was asking about when some of these will finish and not. I still think it'll be late August before any of these start finishing just because they're going to be so healthy. Uh, as far as the rice and cotton goes, there that just goes back to the kind of dog days of summer. Uh, just keeping up with irrigation on everything, spraying plant bugs and cotton, just kind of keeping up. Uh, before I go too far, we did talk about the spraying for Liberty and some of these beans that are kind of getting hairy from all the rains. Something we've been doing down here that we're kind of having good luck with is we've kind of done three different kind of mixes. Uh, when it was earlier and it was cooler of a morning and got hot during the day, we would run Enlist and Liberty together and then come back seven days later and hit it with Enlist and Liberty again, uh, which is an expensive mix. I get it, but it was doing really well. But once we kind of got hot and we noticed our Enlist wasn't working as well in the heat, we have kind of went back to running a lot of straight Liberty, but we were doing the same principle. We just run 43 ounces of Liberty. Seven days later, come back with 43 ounces of Liberty again. Don't go out there and look. Don't do nothing. If you spray it on a Monday, that next Monday, go spray it again. Don't, because if you go look, you'll think they're dying. But I'm going to tell you, another week after that 10 days, that majority of them are going to green back up. So we've had really good luck with that following seven to 10 days later and hit hitting them twice 
And then something we're going to have next week at our training camp is we got two different deals going. Scott mentioned the heavy residuals and relying on that. We've got a couple trials where we did done that and it's looking really good where we spent more money on residuals, staying clean. And then on the back side of that, a couple different scenarios of running herbicide seven days apart to kind of see what it looks side by side. Does that kind of get everything we were going to talk about, Jones? Yeah, I think so. Um, and yeah, I, I appreciate it, Jesse, and I appreciate everybody's patience on that. You know, a lot of times we'll kind of do a little round table before we start this thing in the morning of what we want to talk about. And then about halfway through, Shannon usually reminds us that we should go ahead and record because this is exactly the content that we wanted to talk about. <laughs> and then we've got to be uh, smart enough to remember everything that we've talked about previously, right? So uh, a lot going on for all, <laughs> for all of us in the morning and appreciate everybody's patience patience through all that. Uh, anything else that, that we did not cover that you guys want to make sure we get out there this morning? All right. Well, sounds good. A lot of, a lot of fun just side talk, a lot of, a lot of good stuff. Um, like I said, crop staging is really important on all that. So make sure everybody's kind of out in the field, uh, getting that stuff done. I appreciate everybody tuning in this morning and I appreciate all of your time. You're all's time on a Monday morning, gentlemen, uh, to, uh, fill us in on these updates. So appreciate it. And we will talk to everybody next time. Yep. Thanks you guys. All right. Yeah. Thanks a lot guys. Thank you for listening to the Made for Agriculture podcast, brought to you by MFA, your whole farm solution.